Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on February 14th. Just a reminder this is all in the Realism Overhaul set of mods for Kerbal Space Program, so we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. The mod list is in the video description. The first mission for this stream was to launch a Mars Cycler test. And basically, a Mars Cycler is something that goes back and forth between Earth and Mars on a regular basis. And what you want to put on there is the stuff that you don't want to carry up to orbit twice. So a habitat, you know, space to live for, the Kerbals and stuff like that. And perhaps a life support system. And so that's what I've got here. But I wanted to test the life support system to see uh, to what extent it was um, closed cycle, if you will. In other words, it doesn't need more food, water, and oxygen, because it's got algae and greenhouses on board and stuff like that. So uh, that's what it looks like there, and it's on a new launcher that I've dubbed Ares Prime, which is basically four spatial main engines on the core, and then a J2X upper stage, and the goal was to basically make a rocket that would get to orbit quickly, and especially without that much lag. And so here we go, the four spatial main engines are all on the same part, this is part of the SSTU Labs part pack, and so we get four spatial main engines for the price of one, and as far as frame rates are concerned anyway. So that's why I chose to do this. I also decided to not put separation boosters, and again that's to reduce part count in an effort to maximize the, the frame rates, uh, the physics frame rates especially. Obviously, in terms of actual rocketry, this would not be a very efficient system. SLS would be much more efficient since uh, it can carry a heavier payload and still use the four SSMEs, but with the two solid rocket boosters, of course. Alright, there goes the first stage. Separation and ignition of the J2X. There we go. And fairing separation. And there we have the Mars Cycler with its habitat and life support systems. Now, a cycler is never actually supposed to get into orbit around either Earth or Mars. It's just supposed to go back and forth. So, on one end, you'd have some sort of return vehicle that would bring them through Earth's atmosphere uh, for, for, well, possibly landing, but more likely just to capture around Earth and then wait for something like a Dragon capsule to pick it up. Because you don't want to carry a heavy heat shield with you all the way to Mars. On the other end would be the Mars Descent Vehicle. And so uh, they, they would both dock to it. The problem is that both these vehicles then have to have a much higher delta V in order to catch up with this since this never gets into orbit around either Earth or Mars. So they, have, they each have to go into escape. I intended to move the space shuttle crew onto this or the station crew onto this in order to make the test happen. And so I need to make a correction burn to adjust our inclination because I didn't launch at the proper window. Uh, so that's the end of the J2 stage, and now uh, this has Gemini lander engines on the, well, well there is a little bit of a problem with that. I, I, I don't know if you can see where the Gemini lander engines are. Uh, out there, there they are. I'm gonna select them now because they're not starting because feed pressure is too low. And the reason feed pressure is too low is because I accidentally didn't set that to be a service module tank, I guess? so they aren't getting the right well they aren't getting the fuel into them so that's a problem because I can't really correct the rest of the inclination or make my rendezvous with just the RCS this is way too heavy for that so anyway I inflate the habitat and check whether the shuttle could rendezvous with this but as you can see it would have been really awkward to try and move the shuttle with the life support transfer vehicle attached to it as well as the module tug like that I could get those into the shuttle's cargo bay but then the shuttle itself didn't have that much fuel. It still has its uh, deorbit fuel locked. I could unlock that, but that was not the best idea. So I decided to leave it be and turn to other things. Besides, it wasn't short of life support. It was actually the station that was short of life support, but we can't really move the station to the cycler. Anyway, here is a Mars standard delivery system. And so what we're looking at there is the Vinci engine, which would be the transfer engine to Mars. And then this is the placeholder for the payload and you can see heat shield below it the payload would be about three tons max and then above it is a sky crane it's a little weird sky crane because I really wanted to make sure that the aerodynamics was stable that had communications power and of course you can see the advanced Gemini lander engines uh, on those little extendable pistons 
and the RCS system. And so we have to test all this. It's got parachutes at the top because in Mars you can use the parachutes to help with uh, sending things down safely. And so yeah, you can see the center mass and center lift in this direction are very close together. I didn't think to flip it around at this point to see how it is in the opposite direction in the VAB. But uh, yeah, so my goal is to make it easy to get payloads to Mars surface into orbit. And so we're using the Ares Prime as the launcher again because it's a quick delivery system. And for my first test of that system, we would be launching it to the moon because that's quickest. Otherwise we have to wait for the entire Mars transfer time. And so I wanted to drop off a rover on the moon. And so this is my little rover that I'm making here. Uncrewed at first, so it's got a probe core. Now the key thing is that whatever payload goes into that standard delivery system, it has to have a node on the top and the bottom. That's uh, one thing so that I can have the heat shield and the sky crane on it. But uh, alright, well here we have the rover going around. And you can see I was disturbed by the fact that the wheels were sort of buried into the runway. And we checked that maybe they would emerge here. And well that's a little bit better at least. So just checking out the rover. Of course, uh, since there's full gravity, it's not really a very good test of what the rover can do. But at least it's not completely falling apart here. And of course, we will need substantial rovers on the surface of Mars because, you know, there might be a need to get crew back and forth between various vehicles like the descent vehicle in the habitat or the ascent vehicle in the habitat. It's not necessarily the case that I can land them very, very close together. We might need to transport the crew using rovers. At least until I figure out how to land things very close together on Mars. Alright, so now I have to pack this into the Mars standard delivery system. And so sky crane on top. And here I'm checking that the pistons do extend the engines far enough away from the payload. But it's sort of awkward because the top node on the payload isn't perfectly centered and so I try and prioritize fitting it on top of the heat shield though the wheels sort of poke out a bit it's a wider payload than I had intended so that's a bit of a flaw another flaw is the way that the sky crane is sort of off to one side it's sort of lopsided and I'm relying there on the gimbling on the Vinci engine in order to compensate for that but uh, that might not have been the best idea. The sky crane is much heavier than the rover, by the way. Okay, here we go. So the four SSMEs are ignited and launch. Oh wait. It seems like the engines got caught into the launch pad. I'm sure you've seen this sort of thing before, where the rocket is actually a little bit low and it decides to catch itself in the launch pad. There doesn't seem to be any launch clamps that were unstaged, so... So I tried to revert to VAB, but unfortunately the game crashed, and I had been crashing a lot during this session, so I decided to try something completely different, which is to try and load up a parallel 64-bit install that I had with the same mods. This took some doing because it turns out that not all of the mods were exactly the same and I had to add certain parts, so we had to restart a few times. But ultimately I got the rocket going again, and you'll notice a few new features. Uh, this is 64-bit, so I was able to add clouds using RSS visual enhancements and nice terrain textures and scatterer, which uh, gives us also the ocean effects, the water effects you have there. And so it's a, visually a much nicer sort of experience in 64-bit. The downside is that, well, well, we'll meet many downsides, but there are other glitches to worry about here. And of course, you can't complain to any modders about anything that goes wrong in 64-bit, because it's 64-bit's fault. Uh, it's, all, it's all up to you at that point. But uh, I have no problem with that, I've never complained to modders anyway. Uh, so anyway, a nice look at uh, Florida right there. Very good view. And the rocket proceeds, stage one is almost out. There we go, separate and ignition of the J2X, but if you notice the way that the fairings sort of didn't really release there, interstage fairings, well that's that's one of the problems I have in 64-bit is that 
the fairings don't go off properly. I don't know why some people say that it works just fine for them, but not for me. So except for the fact that I can't stage the upper fairings right now because they'll probably collide with the vehicle. Uh, this stage is going quite well, looks pretty good. I think you'll agree. And again, the third stage is the Vinci engine, which will be our transfer to Mars. And it's got quite a lot of Delta V for that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it is cryogenic, so that Delta V doesn't get to hang around. At viewer urging, I did try to stage the fairings at the top, even though I knew basically what would happen. But uh, at least it didn't destroy the vehicle. It did collide with the vehicle, but didn't destroy it. So they're going to be hanging out right there for a while. Here we are getting close to orbit. And rather than stop it early, I decide to use all the fuel in the engine. Now, this payload is not going over to Mars. It was uh, targeting the moon for a quick test of the whole system. Uh, a shakedown cruise, if you will. But here we go, the third stage is separated, and interestingly enough, the fairings got an additional little boost somehow. So they're floating away. Okay, so that's how it looks, and you can see that it is basically unbalanced at the top, and I'm relying on the gimbling on the Vinci engine to hold things together. But here I make a little mistake. I've already staged the engine, but I'm thinking that I hadn't caught it, because obviously I didn't have any sound. I accidentally pressed spacebar again, and that actually staged the payload. The reason being that the Vinci engine was just extending its nozzle and taking a long time to do that. So uh, now this is in trouble, because I can't transfer it anywhere. Probably the best thing to do would be to deorbit the payload at this point, just for avoiding space junk. Anyway, I try something else that I prepared, which is a return vehicle test. So we need something to bring Kerbals back from Mars, obviously. And I decided that the test pod for this will be Griffin9971, a viewer on Twitch. So this is an SLS block. Two, which means that the boosters are Perios boosters using two F1Bs each. And that gives it an extra payload capacity that I feel is necessary for any return vehicle launch. What we're going to do here is launch this to a very high orbit around Earth and see if it can survive uh, a simulated capture, if you will. So it has to be able to burn off some some velocity in order to get to a lower orbit around Earth while traveling at very high speeds. And so that'll be a test of its heat shield, also the drag, and just the basic survivability of the system. The return vehicle has a lot of Delta V in it. It has a total of 24 Super Dracos, or 12 pairs. And that is because those Super Dracos are also used for the launch escape system should it be necessary to launch Kerbals using this as well. Remember, this could uh, rendezvous with the with the Mars Cycler as well, and dock with that. That's an option. So booster separation went well, and we are once again on four SSMEs. The SSTU lab pack has multiple different kinds of mounts for the engines, and here you see one that is especially suited to the SLS. So they're just one engine, but well, one part there. Okay, so decoupling, that caused a little bit of a pause, but uh, here, waiting for ignition. Still waiting for ignition. Oh, that's because I used uh, RL-10B2s. And RL-10B2s also have the extendable nozzles. Yep. So that's what we were waiting for, the nozzles to extend again, and I learned my lesson. I'm not going to quickly attempt to stage again on the assumption that the engines have not started. So this would be, this is a reshaped version of the exploration upper stage. The exploration upper stage has a different shape than this, but this fits a little bit better with the return vehicle. So same amount of fuel, just a different shape, a more conical shape. Okay, so now we're getting to a very high apoapsis, but I don't want to send this into escape because we want to test it relatively quickly. It's still going to take about 35 days for the orbital period. Take a look at that. And 
at apoapsis, we're going to have to adjust the periapsis to make sure it's suborbital. So I add that maneuver into curve alarm clock. All right, so Griffin is on his way out. And I take care of another piece of business, which is that lunar lander from Aranim that I tried out last time. Now you see a little bit of flaw here, and that resizing of the Mark II capsule happens because uh, the initial sizing used res uh, rescale factor in the configuration, and that's not, not a thing you want to do if you want to be able to make it your root part. And so I fixed that later, but I wasn't able to do it here right now, so I just put up with it and launched that. So uh, actually in the 32-bit install I had already fixed it, but I forgot to fix it in the 64-bit install. It's very easy, it's just instead of using the rescale factor, you just manually change the numbers for the model uh, to the right numbers. So you just uh, multiply each dimension by 1.6 or whatever it's supposed to be multiplied by. Whatever the rescale factor was supposed to be, you just multiply the rest the nodes and the model numbers by that. Okay, well, off we go to orbit around the moon, which takes a lot longer than getting to orbit around Kerbin's moon, of course. Chugging along, had to have to get to about 1600 meters per second. And here we're coming close to it. I have to tilt up to restrain my apoapsis. There are peaceful herbs in Adel 42. Of course, Adel 42 planted the flag on the moon. And here we make orbit. All right, 72.85 by 34.8. And we are now rendezvousing with the station around the moon. Also created by Aranim. So this getting back to the station that it was launched to the moon with. Alright, that's uh, correction burn. Gets us to a close approach distance of 1.7 kilometers where I proceed to get even closer. And there you are. I I have fixed the RCS ports. Well, actually I think Aranim was the one who fixed the RCS ports on this. So uh, I was able to turn it so that it could face the lander, making the docking process easier. So that's done. Okay, and here is the approach. Docking in orbit around the moon. Very Apollo-ish, though with completely different hardware. Okay, getting close, slow down. Remember the docking ports have no magnetism to speak of. So, get it all very nice and lined up. There we go, connection. Okay, so everything is good, docked up. And you might recall the additional module I was gonna add to that station, which was a life support and docking facility. And we had left that in orbit around the Earth. So I decided to transfer that over to the moon here. And there you see the plot, and this is the burn. Again, the Vinci engine, which looks like it's got to be one of my favorites. Probably replacing the RL-10B2 in the long run. Except on the SLS, of course. Okay, proceeding along, and getting close to the end of this burn. There you see the orbit panning out, and there it is. So that's the initial thing, and then we correct with RCS, of course. Little bursts of RCS to fix that, and ultimately another little correction burn is necessary, and you can see me trying to plot that. Problem here, though, is that I think that the station is equatorial. It's not. It's one of the inclined ones. It's not the polar one. It's the one that's about 40 degrees inclined. I forgot about that. And that's going to cause a complication with Rendezvous. I could have tried to put it into something that was in a slightly more matching orbit, but I don't think I could have really matched it the way we were going anyway. So it might have been futile even if I had remembered. So here you see we've got 1,620 meters per second indicated there. And getting into orbit takes about 800. But correcting inclination takes a bunch as well, as you can see. So 
So the whole business gets to be very expensive. And it turns out I couldn't plot anything where the combination of the two would sum up to less delta V than what I had. So anyway, priority is to get into orbit around the moon. And then after that I would have to figure out what to do about actually rendezvousing. So this burn gets it into orbit and corrects the inclination. So that's good. The problem is it's not a tight enough orbit and we can't do the maneuver where we're matching speeds with the station. Now this has to get docked between the lander and the rest of the station. That's the only place to put it. So we have to actually move the lander off of the station, dock this to the station, and then dock the lander to this is the only way to go. Anyway, uh, here I'm preparing to do the burn for orbit and for inclination correction. We've got 32 degrees to correct, which is quite a lot. I thought it was only 40, but it's actually 52. Okay, there goes that stage. And separation. Now here, I didn't realize the RCS on the other stage would continue burning. And so, it decided to come back and meet us again. Uh, I was so caught by surprise by so many things about that. First of all, the fact that those tiny RCS thrusters were actually pushing it faster than our Gemini lander engines could push the main module caught me by surprise. So it took me a while there. But of course, that uh, spin stage is much lighter than what we've got with the docking ports and all. And all that food, water, and oxygen, and fuel. Yeah. Alright, well eventually I waited for the RCS to run out, and that left me in this orbit with 430 meters per second left, and I tried to see whether we could really make a rendezvous like this and retro burn to meet up with the target, and I concluded that we just didn't have enough at this point. So, well, we got a little bit further, and uh, this is marginally more successful, but still not working out quite the way I wanted to. So I prepared another rover mission, and I called it the Burroughs Rover. I solicited options for names, and uh, names that were from sci-fi writers were favorite, and also the return vehicle was named Watney for obvious reasons. So yeah, a reference to the Martian. But uh, Burroughs is a reference to Edgar Rice Burroughs, who wrote some Martian books back in the day. Very different Mars in Edgar Rice Burroughs' books. Uh, Princess of Mars and all that. Uh, it was a movie, but I don't think it did particularly well. Not necessarily a bad movie, but it didn't do very well. Here we go again with the Ares Prime, and we get those brilliant views again. The clouds, uh, well, they're a little bit iffy sometimes. I'm not entirely sure uh, we're getting volumetric clouds. I assume we are, but... It's tough to tell exactly that the clouds are working right sometimes. Used to be that with RSS visual enhancements you actually had to go Alt-E and apply the cloud layers. But I don't think that's necessary now, thankfully, because that was really cumbersome. Seems like that's fixed, but I'm not completely sure. Alright, getting ready for first stage out. That's the end of that. Separate and ignition of the J2X. All good. I've tried various things to solve the fairing bug and they haven't worked. Replacing KSP API extensions which is a plugin that is involved in the procedural fairings. Uh, tried other things but the best solution seems to be actually to resize the stock fairings and use the stock fairings uh, instead of the procedural fairings. And I've adjusted the stock fairings so they're mostly in two pieces though there's still little bits at the top where it sort of makes the cone, uh, but mostly in two pieces, so that's a little bit nicer. And at least those stock fairings decouple, right? Okay, engine shut down on the J2X, and we have separation of the payload again. We've seen this before, and this time obviously I won't try and double stage on the engine. So we have a successful staging of the engine, but there is another problem. For some reason, the engine isn't gimbling. Now, as I told you before, the way the payload is positioned is off balance. 
and I was relying on the engine gimbling to keep us pointed in the right direction. Now you can see me trying to fire the RCS thrusters in order to balance it. I try to turn the RCS off on the top and just use the bottom. You can see the RCS thrusters on that stage there. But that didn't work very well and eventually we went so far out of control that even the RCS thrusters at the top couldn't uh, keep things in line. Also, the increasing g-force from the acceleration, the increasing acceleration made it difficult. So I eventually had to shut down the engine and turn back to the maneuver node. But it wasn't looking like we were going to be able to do this very well. So yeah, trying again. Ignition. And no idea why the Vinci engine doesn't want the gimbal. It does have gimbal, obviously. It just wasn't doing it. Starts out alright, but starts to deviate, and eventually it gets too far. Possibly I could just keep igniting it through those eight ignitions, and this might get over to the moon successfully, but here, I mean, about 200 meters per second at a time, probably we weren't going to make it after all. So, yeah. That's a new wrinkle in the plan for this Mars standard delivery system. This is the system that's supposed to be used for all other payloads to Mars surface. Well, all small payloads under three tons to Mars surface. So this is not working quite right. The first thing to do would be to shift the sky crane so that it's directly centered. But still, not having gimbal on the Vinci engine is not a good idea. Anyway, this was quite an eventful episode. Plenty of launches, stuff going on. Lots of my own payloads that I was testing. Not much by way of success altogether, but at least um, I figured out that certain things need to be fixed, which is the whole point of testing. And we don't want to wait until we have the Mars window to figure out that we need to fix things again. We want to fix those things well ahead of time. So we are on our way with that. So, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.